Hi, I'm Michael Smith from Bad Weasel Games and the GameWeasel.com blog. Welcome to episode 3 of my video series on porting my game Big Bad Sudoku book to Unity 5. The last episode was about the design process and we went over the drawings and renders that went back and forth between me and my 3D artist. The artist has delivered his final versions of those 3D models and he textured them. In this episode, we're going to take a look at those models um, there are a couple of minor issues with them, so we'll look at how I improved them and how I got them ready to use in Unity. Then I'll bring them into Unity and show you what they look like now. So that's exciting. But first, I'm going to introduce you to the subject of porting the code over. So let's talk about learning Unity and the code port for a minute. Before Unity, I was using my own game engine, which used OpenGL2. When I decided to switch to using Unity, I didn't know anything about Unity. I was actually a little scared of it because at some point a few years ago I downloaded Unity and it came with this game demo of Angry Bots. And actually that demo project is intimidating. I mean there's a lot to it. There's all these objects and to a noob like me you don't know what's going on. It's just there's a lot happening in that. And this is a Sudoku game. It's not a third person shooter. I just needed a quick start. So I took a Udemy course called the Complete Unity 5 Development Course. But the first week or so, all I did was take this course. The instructors Ben and Bryce are really easy to listen to, they're great guys, and they get you coding right away, and I, I just appreciated their approach to teaching Unity. And they also keep updating the course and adding new things. You know, originally the course was for Unity 4, and they updated it for Unity 5. So if you're new to Unity like I was, I recommend that you take their course. They've also been nice enough to provide us with a coupon code to get the course at a really great discount. As you can see, this course is normally right around $200. This coupon gets it for a lot less. I don't know exactly, but I think it's even under $40, so that's a great deal. I'm not making anything off of this. I am just plugging it because it really helps me out and they're great guys. You can find the coupon code down in the video description. So anyway, getting back to the code. At some point, we have to get into the meat. It's great to look at graphics and everything, but eventually there's a lot of nitty gritty work that has to be done to actually coding the game. And today I just want to introduce the topic and set it up for future episodes. So what does porting the code even mean? Well, Sudoku Book was originally written in Objective-C and OpenGL, and of course I used Xcode to do that development. Unity 5 uses C-sharp, which is similar to C and kind of similar to Objective-C. And the coding is done in MonoDevelop. So the first issue is just the difference in the syntax between the two languages. Porting the code means translating from Objective-C to C-sharp, which really just equates to me Googling a lot to get up to speed on C-sharp. And that's really no big deal. It just takes time. It's just time consuming. The second issue is that Unity's approach to programming or scripting is that code is attached to game objects. And code in Unity is based on classes because it's C-sharp, so it is object-oriented. Objective-C is also object-oriented, but it's just different. My coding style is not that object-oriented. I'm sort of an 80s C programmer at heart, so I don't always fully follow the object-oriented paradigm, and Unity makes it harder to resist that. So for example, in my own game engine, I draw a scene by explicitly drawing each element in the scene. The background, the numbers, 3D objects over top of that, whatever. In Unity, you're sort of creating the objects and then Unity just draws them. So like in my old code, the method that creates the game board and makes the lines animate, that's just in my main game class somewhere. But in Unity, there has to be a game board object and then that object contains the code to animate itself. That just has to do with code placement. So a lot of the port is taking code that used to be in one place and putting it inside a game object. So in the next episode, we're gonna start looking at some of those game objects and then what the code in them does. There's a lot to this game. It's easy to think, well, it's just a Sudoku game and it should be easy, but this is version four of an established game. So it has to have a little depth and polish. Okay, so let's jump into those graphics now. I got all the models back from the artist. Today I'm only going to cover the pen and pencil box and the sigil because that's all I've really got done so far and then later we'll get into some of the other objects. Here's the model in Cheetah 3D of the pen box. 
I use Cheetah 3D because it's cheap and I usually only need to do simple things to the models like reposition them or scale them, maybe altering the UV mapping. And this is an easy program to do that simple stuff. So he textured this object. Let's add his texture. Cheetah shows it as a flat render here with no normal map or anything. But even still, it's a little like, what's that 60s wall covering? Wood paneling. It looks like wood paneling. So that has to be fixed. Here's his pencil box. Again, we'll add the texture to it. It's just not exciting. You know, there's even a seam here on his UV mapping in the back. Um, so I'm not digging that. The sigil. The sigil looks a little bit better. Um, but like this is an example, you'll notice that the center of the universe is over here. I'm gonna have to reposition it. And then we have his blade here and we have the spears. And he delivered those in separate, um, separate objects because they are gonna to have to animate independent of the main sigil body. So I have to fix this texturing. I don't like this texturing. And then the next issue is his UV mapping, which means where each part of the object is mapped on the texture map. I'm primarily developing for mobile here, so I need to make good use of the texture maps and combine things where I can. Like back here in the sigil, it looks decent, but the UV needs to have different maps for each one of these blades, so I can put text on there. I need to combine the textures for the pin box, the pencil box, and the sigil all in one texture. These are pretty much the only 3D objects that are gonna be in the main game scene, so if I combine the textures here, it should help optimize things a little bit. And I'll show you this in Photoshop as well. Here's my version of the pen and pencil box texture. I used a much older looking wood doesn't look like wood paneling anymore. And then my gold buttons are weathered a little more. I added a little bit of distress to the edge of the numbers here. And then on the pencil box, the numbers need to sort of turn on and off. So there has to be a darker version of the numbers and those are over here. And then the sigil is down below. And see now here it has each of the blades. And then we have the normal maps. And in general, I've been using crazy bump map to make the normal maps. In case you don't know what a normal map is, Normal maps give the object finer details by adding information about how light should bounce off each pixel. It gives the illusion that the object has more detailed geometry. So even a flat surface like the wood here can appear to have bumps and curves on it. And if we zoom in, you can see the grain of the wood in there and how the light's gonna bump off of this one way and that a different way. It gives it a more of a 3D look. I also made some ambient occlusion maps the idea there is that light can't as easily get into certain places, like the corners of these engravings. I'm not actually using AO maps in Unity because this object isn't really moving much and it just doesn't need it. It looks good without it, but I did bake them in. So you can see here in the texture that the engravings have like a little darkness to them. And then in Unity 5, because we're using the standard shader, we need a metal smoothness map. And those are a little bit more complicated in a way. And then another way, they're really kind of simple. The RGB channels, let me switch over to channels here. The RGB channels have the metal map. And actually it's only the red channel that has it, but we do it in all the RGB just to make it easier to see. But normally a material is either metal or it's not metal. And so that's just black and white. Like the buttons and these little in details on the side of the box are metal. Um, but the wood is not metal. So the metal parts are white and the wood and the parts that are not metal are black. So that's really easy. But then they have a smoothness map. And the smoothness is how dull or sharp things reflect off of the surface. 100% smooth would be like a mirror. Having no smoothness at all is maybe like a lava rock or something that just doesn't reflect any light. The complication here is they want the smoothness map encoded in the alpha channel. And that's a problem, at least with Photoshop on the Mac. When you save a PNG file, it pre-multiplies the RGB with the alpha. So let me explain that. All the metal in here, I wanted the smoothness to be at 50%. So that's a 50% gray in the smoothness map. Well, if it pre-multiplies that with the RGB, what it's gonna do is when you save the file, 
it takes whatever the RGB value is and multiplies that by the alpha value. So the alpha value is 50%. So it's going to take the RGB value and whatever it is, it's going to multiply it by 50%. Well, the RGB value here is white because of its metal. So that means the white metal value, which would be 1, is now going to be 0.5, which isn't metal any longer. And that's just wrong. It won't look right in Unity. The solution is really simple, actually. Just don't use a PNG format for the metal map. Instead, I'm using a TIFF file, and that preserves the RGB. It doesn't pre-multiply it with the alpha. So I can have an alpha of 50% and still have an RGB value of 1, and that's what I need here. So let's look at these objects in Unity. To get these objects in Unity, I really just dragged them in. Here's the pen and pencil boxes. The shine really works well on that metal part of the numbers. You can see that shine really good. And then you can see here on the wood part that, the sh that it's not shiny. So let's look at the standard shader on that. It has the albedo, the normal map, and the metallic map for this object. So here's the sigil, which I think looks, looks really good. And the sigil was a little different in, in that we're not using the metallic smoothness map in there. I actually have it in the file, but to optimize the drawing of this object, I don't really need to, I mean, the whole thing's metal and the whole thing has the same smoothness. Um, so I just set those as standard values in here. So I think this is looking really good. And the pen and pencil box look really good. In the game, it's really just a top-down view. So maybe this is an overkill to have 3D objects. I mean, maybe I could have just rendered them and used them as sprites, but the box is gonna move a little bit. It's gonna move back and forth. Um, and I also have an idea that I want to try later on with the light, but I'll keep that as a surprise and we'll see if it works. Believe it or not, there's still a little bit more to do with these models, but it's going to have to wait for a later episode. But to just give you a quick idea, I have to prep it to be used for touch interaction to make it easier to detect touches. Okay, well that's all the time we have for in this episode. In the next episode, we're going to take a break from the graphics and deal with some of this code conversion. I also need to hire a composer to make a theme song, so we're going to get that process started. Please subscribe to my channel, and also please comment and ask questions. There are a ton of little things that go into making a polished game, so if there's anything you want to know about or want me to cover in a future video, please let me know. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.